her on the shoulder. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke. And that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded glumly. It's, it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding of all the things to stop him. But how, how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes between her, beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had 12 hands, but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, though, because he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid's late. Oh, I forgot my Dumbledore voice. Hagrid's late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall. And I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places. I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left now. You don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four, Privet Drive. Dumbledore, you can't! I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son. I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter? Repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all of this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous. He'll be a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There will be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head, famous before he could talk and walk, famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better off he'll be here, growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed, and said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course, but how was the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though he thought he might be ha hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing him. You think it <clears throat> wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart's not in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly. But you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to, uh, what was that? A low rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of headlight. It swelled to a roar as they both looked up at the sky and a huge motorcycle fell out of the air and landed on the road in front of them. If the motorcycle was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. 
He looks simply too big to be allowed and so wild, long tangles of bushy black hair and beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of trash can lids and his feet in their leather boots were like baby dolphins. That's a weird simile. In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved, at last. And where did you get that motorcycle? Bought it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems, were there? No, sir. House is almost destroyed, but I got him all out, all right, before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, they could see a curiously shaped scar, like a bolt of lightning. Is that? whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars come in handy. I have one myself above my left knee that is a perfect map of the London Underground. That's like the, um, the Bart. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned toward the Dursleys' home. Could I, could I just say bye to him, sir? said Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then suddenly, Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. <laughs> Shh! hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. So sorry. <laughs> sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I can't stand it, Lily and Jane's dead, and poor little Harry have to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it's very sad, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or we'll be found, Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blanket, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. <laughs> he was crying. Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, trying to blink back tears. And the twinkling light that shone ahead and from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. <sighs> well said Dumbledore finally. That's it. We have no business staying here. He may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'll be taking serious his bike back. Good night, Professor McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out his silver put-outer. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamp so that Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky. The very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside his blankets without waking him up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken in a few hours time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. 
he couldn't know that at his very moment, people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. And that is the end of chapter one. Tomorrow, we'll hear the first part of chapter two called The Vanishing Glass. I'm really excited to see how many TCN scholars and families have been following along with our read-alouds. I hope you keep following us on Facebook, keep reading the talking points, keep subscribing on YouTube. We're going to put more and more read-alouds and more lessons up for you all to enjoy. And for now, I'll leave you with this. The best Harry Potter house, Slytherin. And TCN scholars, if you disagree with me, you can comment on the Facebook page, ask your parents to borrow their phone, send me a talking points message, maybe send me a video of what you've been learning this week, and I hope to see you soon. Have a good night.